You're listening to the ONP Check-In, an SPS podcast. This podcast brings you the latest happenings in the ONP industry. We're unpacking trends and news from this tight-knit orthotics and prosthetics community. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jackie Green. I'm a marketing specialist at SPS. And I'm Brendan Erickson, regional sales manager here at SPS. Welcome back to our listeners. If you're new to the ONP Check-In, here is what you can expect. In each episode, we provide a quick SPS update and discuss hot topics in O&P with leading professionals in the industry. Before we get started, let's hear a word from our sponsor. A quick side note about today's episode. Brendan is unable to make the recording due to some lovely personal news that we will let him share when he gets back. So South Regional Manager Christina Cox Reagan will be filling in for him during the interview. Okay, let's get back into it. The Spry Step Flex from Tuian USA is the flexible AFO option great for athletes. The Spry Step Flex is helping people with foot drop achieve their fitness goals. Is the Spry Step Flex right for your patient? Find out by contacting your SPS sales account manager. Struggling to find options for patients in need of a foot, knee, or component with high weight limits? Click on over to the SPS blog to read the latest article, Bariatric Prosthesis Options Available for Patients Through 150 Pounds and Above. This list includes products like Philhour's Ibex XD, True Life Zumo, and Blatchford's KX07 4 Bar Polycentric Knee. Review the full list by visiting the SPS blog or following the link in our show notes. So we are incredibly fortunate to be joined today by Adrienne Hill. You might have caught her discussion at the Professional Women in ONP Luncheon at AOPA National Assembly in San Antonio this year. Adrienne is a certified prosthetist orthotist as well as a clinical assistant professor at Kennesaw State University. For the past 15 years, Adrienne has worked with Hanger Inc. in various roles from CPO to clinical manager and area clinical manager. We are excited to chat with her about her experiences as a mentor and explore her perspective as a woman in this involving field. So welcome, Adrienne. Yes, excellent. Thank you guys for having me today. So we are so, so glad you're here. And I am also excited to welcome back our South Regional Manager, Christina Cox Reagan. Welcome. Great to talk to you ladies today. All right, so let's dive in. Adrian, for our listeners who haven't met you or weren't at the luncheon, could you give us a little background about yourself and how you joined the ONP profession? Absolutely. So, um, as you said, I'm Adrian Hill. Um, I'm a certified prosthetist and I'm licensed here in the state of Georgia. So, I've actually been around the field of ONP my entire life. So, my grandfather was a bilateral above knee amputee. He wore little stubbies in the house and he put on grandpa's magic legs and take me out to the movies, out to the park. He was my caregiver probably till I was about nine years old. Um, I definitely remember my grandmother saying like, you know, Adrian, don't you take grandpa's legs to school today? You know, all those kind of things. But the one great part about it was when I was younger, he was the only person that I really got to look in the eye. You know, it's so intimidating when you have older family members and everybody's kind of looking down at you. And especially in my life, all of my family is, you know, five, 10 or six feet or taller. So, um, you know, to have him, you know, look at me eye to eye and having discussions with me um, was really part of my OMP experience. Um, I definitely remember taking grandpa's magic legs for show and tell at school <laughs> when I was younger. Um, and so that was kind of my first experience with ONP. And then my dad is a mechanic by trade. He was helping a lady change her tire in the rain and another car came and sideswiped that car. So after, you know, almost a year of surgeries and in and outs and all those kind of things, um, my father became a below the knee amputee. But he hopped and skipped and jumped and all of those things um, when I was younger. And so that was kind of for me 
you know, the spirit's telling me, you know what, I want you to put people back together again. And so I've been doing that now for 15 years, um, have absolutely and loved it. It has been a passion of mine. It still is a passion of mine. And so with all of that and having the 15 years experience, I took the leap to now teach prosthetics and orthotics at Kennesaw State University's master's program of prosthetics and orthotics. And I've been loving every minute of it, you know, to see the joy and everything on each one of the students' faces. It, it reminded me of the passion I still have or have and putting it into them. So it's been wonderful. You studied to become a, a CPO at the University of Connecticut. What was your experience like at the time versus kind of like what your students are experiencing now? Yeah, so I believe I was probably part of that first transition period to having more women in O&P, but still having that kind of grandfather trade still as part of O&P. So I went to Newington Certificate Program, so which is now the University of Hartford Program. And I love their um, approach at the time because it was very um, clinical driven being ready to be a practitioner as soon as you stepped out of the door. And I love that. Um, so that is why I chose to go to the Newington Certificate Program. And at the time, it was still separated as prosthetics or orthotics. You could kind of pick the track you wanted. And so my first track was the prosthetics track. And at the time, there were 24 students and there were three females and three African-Americans, and I checked two of those boxes for them, <laughs> you know, but the one great part about it is, you know, for me, it was a passion. I knew this was what I wanted to do, and I, I really just took that opportunity to say, hey, this is where we're going to bust the doors down. This is where I'm going to be the one that opens the window or be a part of the one that's opening the window um, in order to let us all come in. So, I think I was part of that first transition period. And to this day, I believe it's only myself and the one one other female that was part of my class that are actually still practicing. Um, so that part I'm happy to, to be a part of. Um, but I will say this, from the Newington Certificate Program or from that um, part of my life, I will definitely say that's where I learned to have tough skin. And anybody that tells me no, that I'm going to turn it into a yes. So I believe that was really my transition time because I'm not sure if you all know, I went to an all girls boarding school, um, Foxcroft School in Middleburg, Virginia for high school. And then not by popular belief, I went to another all female school. I went to Spelman College for for college, even though Morehouse was right next door. Um, I went to two all female, you know, high school and colleges. And so I already had that rah rah for females at that point in my life. Um, so for me, I was like, well, I'm going to show them what I can do. Nobody's going to tell me I'm not going to have great hand skills or nobody's going to tell me I don't know how to trout, not to use a troutman or any of those things. So I took that and ran with it because I wanted them to show I wanted to show everyone that we can be just as strong and just as assertive and just as wonderful as clinicians and practitioners as the guys. I mean, that's awesome because um just that avenue of being all girls, all girls, and then going into this program to where you're one of three had to be such a, you know, moment of like, oh, but at the same time, you're proving yourself about where you want to go and what you want to do. And you really instilled, it feels like, with that drive to succeed and be who you are today, yes. became who you are today. So would you say now in your classes that there is more of like a 50-50 split or are you seeing maybe even more women than guys, than men in your classes or is it still pretty male dominated? So it is actually about 50-50. So our first cohort or the ones that are graduating in May, they are 50-50 split. We have 12 girls, we have 12, bo um, 12 guys. And then in our second cohort, I think we have 13 girls. 
So it's one, you know, one or two steps up in terms of um, the transition to having a larger female class. I think this is a field for everybody, regardless if you are male, if you're female. Um, I think it really is you can find your niche in O and P, in whatever you like it to be. So if you are more on the technical side and you want to get your hands dirty, regardless of male or female, I think we have that for you. If you're more into the engineering and the mechanics of it all or the drawn design of it all, we have that as well. So I'm happy to see the transition to having both male and female in this field. It really truly is a representation of our patient care because we're not just taking care of men. We're not just taking care of women. Um, and so it's real true representation of what our patient care and what our patient load looks like. So as like women and O&P expand more and more, like you're saying, class sizes are more split now. So why do you think it's important for women to be in the O&P industry, aside from what you kind of just were hinting on, uh, our patient population, obviously. And then why do you think in the past this industry has been a little bit more male dominated? So I think it's I think it's twofold when we talk about that. So I think it's important to have women in the industry in bringing more of a nurturing and empathetic side to O&P. Um, this patient has just gone through a truly traumatic experience, especially if they're an amputee or if they're post polio or cerebral palsy, the families are going through an you know, extreme transitions right now, just understanding what their diagnosis is. And so having that kind of empathetic side to everything or having that a little bit more impasse really truly, I think, is where our sometimes softer side as women really truly change the game in O&P. Um, and I think as well as now that we are transitioning to um, EHR systems and more documentation and more, I think that sometimes, and this is just my opinion, um, females, we are a little bit more detailed in that area. And I think as we go to Medicare and go to these insurance companies and are looking for um reimbursement, higher reimbursements. I think that our female touch in terms of here is a nurse or someone that have never interacted with prosthetics and orthotics, reading a patient's chart or reading um, an evaluation that's sent over. I think we're going to give them more of what this patient is, them not ever seeing them. I feel like in our documentation, we give a little bit more. I also feel like this industry truly was probably male dominated in the beginning only because it was a grandfathered business. I mean, you know, somebody's great grandfather made a leg or was tinkering in the garage and then they taught their son and then they taught their son's son and then they taught their son's son's son. And it wasn't I mean, if honestly, if you really think about it, OMP really wasn't put into a book until 1965. With New York, you know, New York University doing the true first kind of this is a PTB socket. Um, so when you think about that, that was, you know, 40, 50 years ago. That wasn't that long ago. Then now you put it into a book and now a female can go and, and look at that book or, you know, hey, dad, um, I know you do this. Can I follow you? Can I shadow you? Um, and so just the transition also in the world, a lot more girls have been born and all those kind of things. And girls have gotten more technical. Um, we are, if you look at the statistics, we are the ones graduating from undergraduate schools. We're the ones getting our master's. It's just the transition in education of 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 women. Um, and so from that, I think that's also another reason why OMP has become the field it has. Because just like myself, I was influenced by the males in my family um, going through something traumatic. But the females in my family were the ones that said, go do it, go do it, go do it. You know, so even if you think about it, when they say like, oh, the men are the head, well, we're the next, right? So I had both of those sides in my family to make sure that I pushed through to this. Well, and you know, Adrian, in the beginning, you know, for years, it was woodworking. I yes, mean, absolutely. Some of my customers' offices, they still have all the woodworking tools. So it's yes, very yes. manual, you know, in its carving of a wood, you know, from a block, you were carving mm -hmm. out um, 
uh, a socket. And then as componentry became lighter and technology, you can see a growth in uh, other areas of medicine where it was male dominated, like physical therapy. And then women came into um, the groups. And then I really feel like progressive owners recognize the need for female practitioners. And with that, they, they wanted a woman in their practice. They wanted to give their patients more options of who was seeing them, who they would be comfortable with. I think it also comes into exactly what you were saying. It was a working, uh, a, a woodworking and more hand dominant or or technical dominant side. I think that another part of that is, I remember I was, I'm not sure if it was my internship, I believe, my internships while I was getting clinical hours. Um, and I assembled a full below the knee prosthesis. And the technician said, okay, well, let me check you because it needs to be man tight. And so I just, that stuck with me. That stuck with me for so long. It sticks to me to this day that I can make this just as tight as you can. And the other half of that is I know what Loctite is and I'm going to go in and put it on there so that I know that it's there. And I'm going to use a torque wrench to make sure that it gets to where it needs to be. So I think a lot of the technologies have changed for us to be able to or as women to be able to do the exact same things and be there in the exact same ways. Um, And then we've got hand skills, too. Right. So as females and as um, women clinicians, we want to bring that side into it as well. We're just as strong. We're just as um, able to do this as the guys. And we're we're standing right beside them when we're going to do this. So that was one thing that definitely stuck out at, during my internship. And um, coming from a family of all guys, so I'm the baby and the only girl, I think my brothers instilled that into me as well, that you can do anything that I can do. You can do anything that they can do. And so um, having somebody tell me that it needs to be man tight, um, that really got under my skin. And so then when he he went to take it off, he couldn't get it off because I had it just as tight. So (laughs) um, I think I take that with me in, in everything I do. What do you think has attracted more women to our field? And and what is the timeline of that? Because obviously we have more women in the last 10 to 15 years than ever before. What do you think is drawing them to us? I think ONP has always been that combination of engineering and drawn design. So it's bringing art and science together. And I believe, and this is just my opinion, I think now that we are getting more creative with materials, we're getting more lightweight with materials, I think we are looking at that half of the art side more now than we ever have. It was kind of um, before it was one style socket, everybody kind of got a bucket style socket. And now we're looking at the intimacy and the total contact and the art and design side of ONP, I really feel the attractiveness to ONP has come from that. The more focus on pediatric practices than we probably ever have ever had is also another way that females or women are being attracted to the field of ONP, not just for cranial remolding, but pediatric AFOs, pediatric um, prosthetics, as well as just um, since we are the ones having the babies, you know, our children are affected by something that applies for ONP. So therefore a sister, a cousin, they'll say like, oh, my nephew had cerebral palsy or my nephew had, you know, whatever their abnormal tone was and they wore AFOs. And then just being there to see them walk for the first time or be able to run for the first time. Now they have that as a career path in their head just from having it at a younger age. And they're like, you know what? I want to go into that. And so I believe just now OMP being more in the forefront and families and people actually taking care of their children to say like, oh, my child has, you know, has um, plagiocephaly. I'm actually going to do a cranial remolding helmet and everybody's seeing. I think people are getting more comfortable with abnormalities and being more vocal about 
um, diagnoses. And that's what I feel like is bringing women into the field as well. Anytime you have a, your circle of sp- scope, so to speak, comes mm-hmm. into play, then you're experiencing something that other people are not. And then I also think just in general, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan put us, our industry in newspapers and on yes, television. Absolutely. And to a point that it was not that way prior to. And so people read about it and they read the success stories and they read the rehab stories. And I think there's something so appealing. And we saw men and women benefiting Mm -hmm. um, and participating in our industry. And um, it, it just just what's the word I'm looking for? It's like just the seeing us. What are, I'm curious for you answering this one, because I'd love to know, what are some of your experiences or what are some things that you have experienced that maybe your male counterparts have not experienced? Well, I told you guys the story about the male, you know, the man tight. Did I make it man tight? Um, so I have had two children in while I've been practicing in OMP. One thing I want to talk about is when I was pregnant Uh, With my first child, um, I was a clinic manager at the time, and but I was in a one clinician, one OA office. And we had a discussion about, you know, I wanted to talk to him, you know, when I think I was about five months or six months pregnant about what happens to the office when I was a clinical manager, what happens to the office when I go on maternity leave? And he was like, oh, we'll just talk about it in a few. And I was like, well, I will be gone for quite a bit. He's like, yeah, you'll be back in three weeks. I said, no, no, no. I'll be back in three months. And I don't think he ever kind of thought about that as I will be losing a full-time clinician and full-time clinic manager for three months, not three weeks or three days as the paternity side of everything. This is the maternity side of clinic management. And I don't think at the time he had ever even thought that far. And so having more females in management and having more females as um, clinicians, I think that is something that my male counterparts have never even thought about or asked about or anything like that. Modifying how I'm, you know, modifying the way that the table was set in the lab. So when I was nine months pregnant, being able to modify my legs in the lab. Um, changing the heights of the tables. Not at the time, I think now most clinics have a high-low table, but some of them still do not. And being able to adjust the high-low table for a patient to be able to um, adjust to where my belly was while I was pregnant. Those were things that just my male counterparts have not thought about or figured out. And so as being a mentor to other female clinicians now, I say, don't think that you need to stop just see how you need to modify or adjust your clinic so that you can still be there and working and um, being a part of the team. Um, so I, I know that's one side that I don't think has ever been discussed about the maternity side of clinic management and ONP. Our industry is still in a recognition phase Absolutely. of maternity leave. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just point one little thing out. My sister works for a law firm. Their maternity policy, and, and by the way, an HR law firm, their maternity policies are incredible because they have a desire to recruit the most talented women, men and women, but they know in order to get the top women, they have to have really good maternity plan. Absolutely. And yeah. as a recognition that more women are entering our field, we need to have better maternity plans. Absolutely. Anyway. Yes. And so I think there's so much our industry could discuss around the female practitioner. Because I, yeah. I'll tell you, I'd say the men would like it too. Industry and I think it's wise. also the change in generation. Just as if I was the transition generation for um, the field in terms of education, I'm also that transition generation because 
I grew up with my grandparents and that older generation, baby boomers and the Gen Xers, um, and their drive for perfection, I want to say. So you stay there till it's done. I mean, there was no 40 hour work week. It was you stay there till it's done. So if it's 40 hours, you know, you could be at 60, 80, 120 hours within just that week, just because there was no leave at five o'clock. You stayed there till it was done. And if it was done at 1030, if it was done at 11 o'clock, you stayed there and then you got back up the next morning at 6 a.m. and kept it going. And that was the earlier generation, right? And then I'm also learning from the younger generation, the Gen Zers, the the um, the later millennials. They were like, no, my my contract says nine to five and I work from nine to five. And at five o'clock, I turn off and then I go do my self-care. I am that transition generation in the middle where it's like we still got to get it done. I do want to go home at five. But about that my patient needs me. I have to get it done. So we got it. We have to kind of learn from both of those generations and find somewhere in the middle. Um, but as the generations are changing and as the um, influx of clinician that comes in have a different mindset of what work life balance looks like, we have to make that transition that way as well in listening to our clinicians listening to what they're saying. So when it comes to maternity leave, when it comes with benefits, when it comes for work-life balance, when it comes for days off, if it comes for flex schedules, the industry will die if we do not start making the changes because we're educating all of these students and we want them to stay in the industry. You can look at a lot of just undergrad programs in general, how many of them go into exercise science, how many of them go into biology or whatever it is, and you ask people like, well, are you actually doing what your major is? 80% of people say, no, I want this to be your career, not your job. And I want them to stay in it. So as, as we become area clinic managers, as we have come into upper management in any part of OMP, we're going to have to start listening to our staff. I think we may have just answered the question that I was <laughs> going to ask you, which was, what are some ways that can, clinics can become more inclusive? There you go. <laughs> it, we, and and I'll, I'll tell you, I've done this a long time. I'm concerned at people leaving, like yeah. having known people and they don't make it out of the first five years. Yes. And it's, we need them desperately in our yeah. industry. And so I think our ability to do what we just talked about in regards to flex or recognition or just an overall understanding that we are in a generational shift mm -hmm. and that we need to be paying attention to the generational shift. Yeah. Do you have any more ideas around, you know, inclusion that we can talk about? Um. So, yes, I do. <laughs> well, one of them I just told you all. Um, one thing that I'm hoping that clinics um, can start transitioning or looking at is a flexible day. Looking and actually surveying or, or asking our patients what would be helpful for you, because that may be helpful for the clinician as well. So for those of us who are mommy practitioners, right? So maybe the better schedule is a six to two schedule. Like not that we want the clinics to be open 24 hours, but a six to two schedule. And then someone else comes in eight to five and then someone else comes in 10 to seven so that we're fitting in because if we have patients who are in elementary school, a six o'clock appointment or early appointment for our patient as well as the clinician may work better. Or as the clinician's have availability, making those type of changes for the demographic of the patient and actually polling the patients. Some of our clinics, um, regardless if you're private practice or public, you know, are heavier on the pediatric side or heavier on the geriatric side. Most of our geriatric patients want to be back in their house by two o'clock before the traffic gets crazy, having those options for them. Um, so I think maybe starting by polling our patients first to see what the options are 
so that that may be well. Um, and if we're doing that, make clinics be flexible like that as well. Even if, and I know I'm the last one to say this, but if it is a Saturday, one Saturday a month where, you know, we have open for like not necessarily walk in or send in patients, but that is a transition to say like, hey, I know this particular patient has works from six, seven to seven. So even if our, if you think of our hospital staff, our hospital nurses, MAs, techs could never come see us without having to take a full day off because they work seven to seven. And I think, like I always think specifically for women being on the younger end of millennials, the flex time and the benefits are so important because I think a lot of my friends as we're entering into baby years, we don't want to stop working, yes. but flexibility and knowing our company is going to support support us to be a mom, but also show up and do our job well is really important, I think, for all industries, but especially, especially in a job where it is a face-to-face -face clinician job where you need to be there for your patient. And that's the hard thing about healthcare in general. We need to be face-to-face -face with our patients. I have a, several of my friends who work for larger industries and are like, oh yeah, I have a work from home job. Well, O&P is not a work from home job, you know, um, but I do have another suggestion that um, a, now that we are on an EHR system in 90 percent of O&P field at this point, maybe even 100 percent at this point now, we've all transitioned to electronic record. If you have your schedule a certain way that one day a week is an eval day or something like that. And it's an evaluation for a wrist splint. It's an evaluation for um, a walking boot or whatever it may be. Maybe you're teaming up with a physician's office and you can do that evaluation over the phone or over um, Zoom or FaceTime or Teams with your patient. I think that will also change the way we do clinic or the way that would be maybe that person's one day flex day um, they're, they're just doing evals that day and that's from home. And it also helps our patient because now they're not paying for two um, transportation visits. I worked in downtown Atlanta and a lot of my patients come on um, public transportation. So not, are they, not only are they paying for that particular Southwest Trans or whatever the transit, healthcare transit people are to come for just the eval, if it requires authorization, pre-authorization, they can't even get their item until a second visit. But if I had done that eval, put in that documentation, get, gotten everything I needed from that initial visit over the phone, submit it for pre-authorization, now that patient is only making one transition to my, I mean, one transportation visit to my office. I'm saving them money. I'm saving them time. And I think they really appreciate that. So um, I think that's another thing to make it more inclusive and make the clinics more available and as for the clinician as well as for the patient. Who are some mentors in your life that have kind of helped you get where you are and helped you flourish throughout your career? Oh, yes. I have I will be one that I've had some of the most amazing mentors. Um, and I always say this, I want to learn as much as you have forgotten. That's all I want to know. The stuff you've forgotten is what the stuff I want to learn. Um, and so some of the major influencers for myself still to this day, I still call them um, are two people right here in Atlanta, Georgia is Miss Leslie McDonald Wright and Mr. Tony Thaxton. Um, they have been major, major influences to me as clinical mentors. Um, they have been on the management side and decided to step back and just be on the clinical side. Um, they are African-American male and female clinicians. So being able to talk with them about how it was, like how it is as being African-American clinicians in the industry. Um, and I wanted to also have a male and female perspective. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add um, to our conversation today for our listeners out there? Because I love ONP and it is a passion of mine, I want anyone and everyone to have a passion for their career, regardless if it's in OMP, if it's in art and design, if it is in healthcare, if it is in mechanics, if you like cutting grass outside, 
I want it to be a passion for you. When you go to introduce yourself to someone and say, hi, my name is Adrian Hill. I am a certified prosthetist orthodist. I want you to say it with a smile. And I want to I want someone to feel it coming out of your fingertips, coming out of your hair. I want the passion to be that way. I want you to pick a career path and pick your life's work so much that no matter what it is, when you say your name and what you do, it's passion that they feel. I am so glad you're an educator. (laughs) No, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. This was wonderful. (laughs) So if you would like to learn more about Kennesaw State's MSOP program or more about Adrian. follow the link in our show notes. Adrian, thank you so much for joining Absolutely. us. Absolutely. You all have a wonderful day. Well, there you have it. Thank you for listening to the ONP Check-In, an SPS podcast. If you like what you hear, hit the subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Please rate and review the show to help fellow ONP professionals find us. We'd also like to hear from you directly. What topics do you want us to cover? Do you have any burning questions? Email us with your thoughts and feedback at SPSpodcast at SPSCO.com. See you next time. Bye. Bye.